Mr. Simon Crean, thank you again very, very much for the honor for having come to the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. Uh, we really benefited from your keynote address. We'd like to take the opportunity now just to ask you a few follow-up questions uh, based on some of the insights and the perspectives you shared with us in the lecture. First question I want to ask you is something we've spoken about already, uh, but I want to get on the record uh, your answer uh, and also share with you or learn from you some of your perspectives. What is cultural diplomacy, uh, once again? And then secondly, uh, how do you think cultural diplomacy can assist in promoting cross-continental cooperation? Uh, and then what importance do you see in today's world for cross-continental cooperation? Three questions. Well, cultural diplomacy is deepening the relationship but strengthening it in particular through person-to-person -person contact with an understanding as to the background of the country you're engaging with. It's important to understand their side of the equation and try and find the common values but at the same time understand the differences and seek to resolve issues based on that better understanding. Now how can it assist? Um, I think in many ways. I think that cultural diplomacy, this people to people engagement is fundamentally important. If we just leave it to governments it's missing out on the stakeholder input. And for all governments, they have to engage the stakeholders. What I think we've got to look at in the stakeholders is that they bring a different approach to either the problem solving or to an understanding of the issues in question. So as communications has broadened, as the means for dissemination of information and therefore understanding has proliferated, it's incumbent upon governments to look beyond just their engagement to other people-to-people -people engagements for a strengthened relationship. Having said all of that, I think the fundamental point in all of it is the people-to-people -people contact. You need to engage and understand and relate at a personal level. And I think it's that personal level through a widened understanding through whatever form can help address an issue that transcends borders, that comes back more to a values set, more to a common objective. Okay. And then just to the third question regarding cross-continental cooperation, is that at all relevant in the sense there's a, you know, the one thesis that the goal of the nation state is to be independent. And once you've reached your independence, you've succeeded and you can do whatever you want. There's the counter thesis that actually we live in an interdependent world. And as much as we want to be free and do whatever we want, we can't. Uh, and really we have to accept this global interdependence. Uh, do you see relevancy in this cross-continental cooperation? And if so, what? But the interdependence is the reality, isn't it? I mean, the global economy requires global solutions. No one country can solve or advance its interests just by being an island nation. It's not to say they should give up their value set, give up their sovereignty, give up uh, the issues that are important, but if they want to engage more effectively, diversify their economic base, um, and advance their cultural interests. They have to accept the interdependency, and once they accept that, you've got to engage on a bigger front than simply the political one, simply the government-to-government -government one. The cultural dimension, um, I think, is an important vehicle. Not the only one, but it's important. Yeah, um, I would like to uh, ask you a question regarding uh, Australia is very well known for its uh, one of the countries that cultural diversity is is the essence of that country. And uh, as a person who have been in government and in politics in different portfolios, what is the biggest challenge you can see in addressing this cultural diversity? Would it be maintained or would it be fragmented after a while? No, I think it'll be, I think the diversity will be seen as an asset, should be seen as an asset. I believe it is an asset. I think a country that has 
the richness of cultural diversity that we have by being home to the oldest culture on earth but welcoming to the greatest diversity of the cultures on earth, it's done a lot to define us. And I think an important value in that definition and what makes us attractive is that we do have this commitment to tolerance and understanding. I also think that because we have now embraced and understood the significance of our indigenous culture and have fundamentally respected that in a more meaningful way, this too is important in our region because countries that themselves respect their cultures respect others who respect uh, theirs. So I think that uh, now that that um, that dimension has occurred, that we have benefited from our multiculturalism, I think it's here to stay. And whilst there will always be attempts to try by some in the community to narrow us back, I think the overwhelming sense of the public is that there is strength in that d diversity, there's pride in it. It's an important part of our brand. We don't have to invent it of ourselves, it is us, and people admire it, and uh, we should be proud of it. Uh, with regards specifically to the Asia-Pacific region, how do you think the region can contribute to the strengthening of cross-cultural cooperation, and in your opinion, what would you say the economic, political, and cultural roles of the Asia-Pacific region are in the new world order? Well, I think the growth of Asia is the great phenomenon of our time. It is the great opportunity of our time. It is huge new markets emerging and new wealth creation. And it again is the reinforcement of the point, the best way to lift countries out of poverty is to develop their economy. And that's happening. It's happening in a huge way. If you had said 20 years ago this was going to happen, people wouldn't have expected the magnitude, but I think the economic liberalisation in China has been um, a fundamental part, but I think too in the ASEAN group of countries as a whole, it's true. I mean, China is our biggest trading partner, but ASEAN collectively is bigger than China. So here are new opportunities, and what do these countries need as they develop? They need food security, they need resource and energy security, they need skills development. In many ways this is the economic relationship going beyond the commodity trade, even the product trade, it's the services trade. So that's the big challenge as well as the investment flows. So I think it's incumbent upon developed countries to work with developing countries to understand their different stages of economic development and work cooperatively, not to take advantage, but to work in partnership for mutual advantage. So I see great opportunity in Asia. I think Europe should look more to Asia and I think it should be doing it. Again, in partnership may be, either doing it directly or looking to where this, you know, the common objective can be um, determined and work accordingly. Well, the past six years have been rather intense and eventful for your party, the Australian Labour Party, and um, the recent loss of elections has effectively stopped your party from being able to rule the government. So what do you believe the underlying causes bef uh, behind the loss of the elections were in 2013? And on the other hand, what do you believe that your party can do to regain strength and re-establish itself as the ruling party? Um, and then also, how do you think that the shift in power, which we've seen now, is going to affect Australian citizens with regards to human rights and cultural and economic factors? Well, as, as for the six years, um, Whilst it's always bad to lose elections, the public always gets it right. Um, the six years were not a loss to the nation. I think for the first three years we were a hugely successful government. Um, we weathered the global financial crisis, the only developed country in the world to have avoided recession 
continued to grow strongly, jobs, real wages, keep inflation low, keep interest rates low, and build the national savings pool, which is important for that investment uh, factor. I think the Armenian question was all about uh, foreign, foreign investment versus domestic. I think also, even in the troubled last three years, there are important social reforms, commitment to a national disability insurance scheme, for example, the building of a national network for fast speed broadband. This is not just connecting the nation, it's enabling individuals, businesses, the e-commerce revolution, e-education, e-health. This is essential infrastructure that countries have to invest in. And also the expansion of our retirement incomes policy. What does the, this government hold? Well, it opposed what we did on the National Broadband Network. It opposes advancing retirement incomes policy. It does support the National Disabilities um, Insurance Scheme. The lesson, I think, is that governments that are squabbling or parties that are squabbling, but it's not just governments, but parties that can't get their own house in order find it difficult to appeal to a public that expects order of governments and expects actions of governments. So the Labor Party can get back um, in one term, but it has to become united. It has to see leadership not through the prism of the leader, but leading a team and it has to get a narrative and it has to be proud of its brand and build its agenda off that brand. Now, I also believe that the government that's won didn't win in its own right, we lost. Oppositions don't win elections, governments lose them. Unless this opposition really demonstrates an agenda, which up until now it hasn't, then there is a real opportunity for us to fill the gap. But we have to be united, we have to get that uh, narrative back. I think there is a risk on the asylum seekers issue that the, a tendency to xenophobia, a looking inwards on ourselves, could happen. I hope that's not the case. Um, Australia alone can't solve the immigration problem confronting us. We need a regional solution. But the current government has opposed a regional solution in the past. Let's hope they see the wisdom um, in such an approach, work properly through the UNHCR, and deal with it as part of a more orderly processing arrangements where people can be processed before they reach our shores and in which we increase the refugee intake, not just in Australia, but other countries that can afford to take them. That's the way to deal with um, that sort of an issue. So, you know, there's a, a task ahead for the opposition in pointing to an alternative set of ways, but even though we've lost and we lost heavily, um, the opportunity's there to rebuild, but only if you make something of it. I want to... Uh to continue in, in the same wavelength and uh, follow up on the last question. Um, now, aren't you afraid that the internal politics uh, could really affect the work of Australia <clears throat> during the last three decades? And in a way, to come up with something could be more radical in a sense, just to uh, to sort out the political issues internally, without actually looking at the uh, legacy of Australia. Uh, we can see the uh, immigration law. Um, others could be coming in the in the way that could violate the human rights, and also it could come up with a sort of a trade-off, something for something. Is it uh, human rights or development, which, uh, or the development of human rights? Or uh, it could come up from other source, security versus development, or security versus human rights. This is internally 
usually addressed in, in, in a political issue rather than from a human rights sort of uh, background. Yeah, I think that there's strong bipartisanship in our country on the human rights issue. Um, that's not to say it's easy to deal with. Um, we've raised issues with China, for example, in relation to uh, human rights. Um, we always do that through the um, uh, appropriate uh, channels, and I think there is bipartisan support for it. As to whether the country regresses, that depends on how determined the current government is to take us back. And the area that that could happen is on the refugees, but Indonesia has already very strongly signalled that the policy approach that the new government wants to take, they will not accept the so-called turning of the boats back. Therefore, there's no point proposing a solution that's not going to work. The public will understand in pretty short order that this is a policy that can't work. What you've then got to do is to do what we, in my view, fail to do properly in government, and that is to present the alternative, something that can work. And herein, there's an interesting historic perspective, because we have accepted in the past large waves of immigrants from Indochina, mm -hmm. out of the Cambodian and the Vietnamese um, wars, the Vietnam War and the Pol Pot um, regime. But they didn't arrive in Australia by boat. They left their countries by boat, but they were processed in countries on the way here by agreement. There were understandings which the government established to process in country, to get agreement from the country from which they came to return if people were found not to be genuine refugees and in circumstances in which Australia was prepared to take a larger intake as part of a global solution for a larger intake. Now, as much as we've got a problem with asylum seekers, the world has a problem with settling dispossessed people, displaced people, people on the Syrian borders. There's lots of people in this circumstance where the issue has got complicated for us, and this is what tugs at people, is that people smugglers have got involved. But, and we do need to crack down on people smugglers, but blaming or, or putting the person who's paid for the passage in the same category as an illegal boat smuggler is a big stretch. Because one is seeking asylum often for legitimate reasons, sometimes not. Some are doing it for economic reasons, and in that case, they'd be returned. But I think we've just got to get order, common sense into the system, and we've got to look at it from that perspective of what's in the best interests of humanity, yeah. not just yeah. what's the convenient interest for a particular country at a pertinent point in time. Mr. Green, I'd like to ask a final question uh, to do actually with the next generation. A uh, big emphasis of the work of the ICD is what we call young leaders, uh, or the next generation of leaders uh, in an interdisciplinary sense from countries around the world. When we say leader, we really say we want drivers, not passengers, who are the young individuals who want to give to society, who want to get involved with leadership in the sense of service, you know, serve their communities. You are a very experienced leader. Uh, you've had a number of ministries uh, in the Australian government really dedicated your life actually to leading. Uh, so I just wanted to give you an opportunity and also to ask you if you could offer one message uh, for the next generation of young leaders uh, in Australia but also in the global sense what would that message be uh, in the sense you know today's society is very difficult we have a serious crisis economic crisis this and that what would your message be to the next generation of young leaders I think it's pursue your passion be confident in what you set out to achieve don't be deterred by the knockbacks. Everyone gets knockbacks. Persist. Persistence is important. But also realise that there's a limit to what you can do as an individual. It's an important part to be proactive, progressive, innovative and creative. But you've got to build a team around you. You've got to develop a team. You've got to do it collectively. And that means, I think, involving people 
in the process, engaging them. I talk about engaging the stakeholders, but it's as much involving individuals and getting a collective ownership, an ownership and advocacy for the cause. And, you know, I have great confidence in the young people of today. They're far more intelligent and knowledgeable than we were in our day. The information that you guys have at your fingertips, we would have killed for in our day when we were studying, quite frankly. And knowledge is the key. Communications is the key. The ability to communicate, to express, to inspire, that's what's going to advance this nation and that's what you guys have to do.